This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Okay. And today's guest, we've got David Bickford. David, how are we? Thank you very much indeed for having me, James. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. And you? Yeah, really good, good. Thank you. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Very interesting topics. You worked with MI5, MI6, with the intelligence. You're also a book author, very outspoken about certain things in the world that needs speaking about. But yeah, it's good to have you on. It gives people a different spin of it and a different understanding of the importance of what actually goes on kind of underground in the world and you've lo- loved it firsthand basically yeah no thanks very much for having me james yeah. yeah no i was legal director for mi5 and 6 that was a fascinating job yes sure so uh, just be- before we get into everything i always go back to the start mm, of my guest yeah, but sure. i just want how can so did you get clearance to speak about certain things yes yeah yeah and there's, because there's not many who do get clearance, no, is there? No, not at all. So you must be trusted then with the information that you have to then speak. Yeah, when I, when I first joined uh, the agencies, um, it was a time when they were going from the Cold War and in, into terrorism. Cold War hadn't ended. Um, but there was a different take on things, and uh, there had been some problems with the Peter Wright book that had been written illegally, and they tried to stop it and couldn't. And they decided that perhaps they needed um, a proper legal department, plus the ability to, for the agencies to talk to the press. So my first job there, apart from being the lawyer, was to be the liaison with the with the media. So I was able to talk to the media, got into this sort of habit of talking about the things I could talk about and about not about the things I couldn't. And therefore, I've been trusted since then to talk on the basis that i won't say things that i shouldn't you must be very well trusted then because normally people speak out of school but again in that sort of environment i'd imagine it'd be cut thrown. i know it's a bit, bit cringe for a man who's lived it but you see your james bonds and stuff mi6 people it's fascinating for people that sort mm. of obviously that's fiction but you know the mi5 mi6 it's always it's nobody really ever knows what's going on but Again, before we get into everything, no, I always like to go back to the start of my guest, David, get a bit of understanding about yeah, you, sure. where you grew up and how it all began. Yes, yeah, right. Well, I think it sort of started exciting because I was born between two air raids in the war. My mother said the first bought me on and the second finished me off. <laughs> uh, and my father was, was abroad in, in uh, um, Salon during the war. He, he operated against Japanese when he came back, uh, he set up an airline to South America with a friend of his um, in the RAF. And so my first trip to Brazil was when I was aged six. I was put into boarding school. Obviously, the parents lived abroad. Well, that was exciting. Converted bomber across the South Atlantic, which in those days was quite a good trip. 
uh, and spent a lot of time, summer holidays, going out to see my parents there, a boarding school in England, which was um, absolute bliss because no parental authority, so I was totally independent and wild. Sort of set one up for MI5 and MI6. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you had a pretty good upbringing then, pretty adventurous. Yes, indeed. Yeah, mm. it, 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 it was um, tremendous. And, and also meeting um, kids of one own age out in South America, Brazil, Chile, uh, Argentina, um, it gave one a very early good scope on, on other people in the world, how they lived, and it was an exciting, it was a very exciting childhood. I used to live with my grandparents. They were out in a lone rectory out in, a, in, in the countryside in, in Huntingdon. And there were some Latvian refugees there. So one got to know them. They were great fun. We used to roam the fields with an Afghan hound and a cat. Mm -hmm. So, yes, very was, free, very free childhood. Was dad around a lot? Was he around a lot? Obviously, I saw I saw him during summer holidays. Was that it? He he's brilliant. I mean, both my parents are absolutely brilliant. Ne never never had any problems. They were they were wonderful, and they let me free, which I think is mm -hmm. very important as a child. Because obviously, if not having the parents around there, people's life can go totally different. Mm -hmm. And I always speak about this, but the majority of people who get involved in crime come from the broken home, mm -hmm. and it's not as if your parents abandoned you but they weren't there where you've got the fun kind of discipline from your father and the loving energy from your mother did it affect you in any way growing up Not or did you just feel free and alive because yeah. you traveled the world had good grandparents yeah we yeah. we a good kid then no no <laughs> <laughs> uh, i was usually in trouble at school but we we had an interesting system um a, a boarding school um what I mean, boarding school I was boarding school in, in uh, Huntingdon and then downside boarding school in, in Somerset. And uh, the, the heads of both those schools believed in a lot of sport. And, and right from the beginning at, at, um, boarding, at my first boarding school, we were all put into boxing for the first term. And uh, that was very carefully managed because those kids who didn't like it weren't pushed to it. The other kids who seemed to get on with it were taken on and taught boxing and i think in a sense that teaches you two things first of all how to look after yourself and second if you've got an opponent that um uh, one might be being beaten up oneself <laughs> which mm -hmm. happens quite frequently but if you're you're in a position where you're stronger than your opponent you also have to start thinking well do i really want to take this guy out there's no no point to it so it also teaches you a balance in life that i think that has stayed with me uh, ever since. Yeah, it's, it's so important for any sort of combat for any young man mm. on this planet, whether it's boxing, karate, Muay Thai, whatever it is, any sort of combat sport is so good for the mindset, also calms you as an individual, because every mm. madman I know, every guy who shouts and screams are the ones who can't fight. I used to train in a place called the Grip House in Glasgow and do Muay Thai. Oh, right. And you would never think of these people, I never trained killers. Mm. They're just so placid, skateboarders, just getting on with their life. Not everybody, but I'm just, they were just good people. They never screamed or shout, but you go to the local pub, everybody's loud, everybody's daft. Yes. It's just, for me, it shows a sense of weakness. I never realised that for many years later, but we're living in a very soft generation. It's the gayest generation we've ever been in. I think one in every five is gay, bi, trans. And I've no issues with any of it, but no. we're becoming very soft and weakened for men and women's roles naturally on this planet. We're kind of lost in a system where everybody's confused and it's a soft, very soft and weakened generation that we're in. Yeah, I, I've got nine grandchildren, ranging from a doctor down to a, um, a grandkid who wants to go out and help penguins in Antarctica. <clears throat> And I find in their own way, they're very strong mentally. Um, I, I, I agree. I mean, certainly for my generation, the sort of wartime generation, um, we were all brought up to scrub a floor if things went wrong. You know, you couldn't sit down and, and think about life too much. You, you were sent out to do things. Uh, I think that has changed. I'm not sure that it's changed for the worse. I think we've got a, 
certainly a generation that I look at, generations aging from 32 down to 10, that seem to me to have life pretty well under control. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm, yeah, I just feel as if it's becoming a weaker society. I don't know why, um, but more people are more likely to turn to addiction, crime. Um, a lot of people struggle mentally now, suicide rates through the roof as mm. well. There's a lot of external things out there that people seem to be gravitating towards instead of, I don't, listen, the system's the system, but a lot of people are struggling mentally, financially, and I think some sort of more discipline of the old school mentality of toughen up a little bit, push on, pull the big boy pants up and kick on. But again, everything's feelings and emotions and I understand that as well. But I just feel for the men's side of things, I don't know if it's as strong as it was 50 years ago, 70 years ago. Men were more respected. They looked after themselves well. But I just feel things are changing a little more. Maybe I'm wrong as well, but that's just for the people who I interview and the things that I see are just... And homelessness as well. Mm. A lot of big numbers are through the roof, and sure. a lot of struggles. Yes, that 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 that's the struggle. I think is 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 harder. I, I I think that's certainly right. I think in many ways I've been very lucky to work with um, people who are able to look after themselves. Certainly in five and six. I mean, the women and men there are um, incredible. Um, and they, they, they look after themselves, but they also um, understand where the stresses and strains come from, uh, and they're able to handle them. Um, and that society is completely across the board. I mean, from university down to people who, who are not down, but across to, to people who've entered very young, um, and they all work together. Whether that's the whether that's partly because they've been chosen to have that particular mentality and ability, I don't know. I, I don't despair of the younger generation, put it that way. Yeah. Uh, how long did you end boarding school for? Um, from six till I left it when I was 17. So left at a very young age to kind of yeah. find, find, it for your, find out for yourself what life was about? That was really good because... Um, I came out at the time when national service had finished. I was too young to do national service, but a lot of people went to university. And my headmaster said, David, you're going to waste your time at university. Go straight in and um, do an apprenticeship in the law, which I did. Uh, so I had uh, four and a half years starting licking stamps on envelopes, mm -hmm. being given all the worst clients, <laughs> generally being kicked around. Did me an enormous amount of good. Uh, again, I think I was lucky because I was able to be independent and free. One could sort of handle mm -hmm. uh, that. Did everybody else had that mindset though, David, at the boarding school where it was kind of get on with it and mm. find for yourself basically? Yes. Did everybody have that? Was it because there was more discipline or like you say, there was a bit more freedom, but it was a lot of discipline of this is your structure, this is your plan, this is your daily routine. There was more routine to your life, would it give you more purpose? Yes. Do you certainly. think that's important? I think that's very important. What about national service? Do you think that should be come back? I think it was very good when it was when it was there. I, there's a big debate about that at the moment. Um, whether or not we need it in terms of setting up a, a, a structure to protect ourselves against possible Putinism, um, I don't know. I leave that. I leave that to the military. Uh, again, I, 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 I get where you're coming from about discipline, and I think it is incredibly important. Um, but I think also my generation were used to a much sort of harder environment. We we didn't see chocolate until we were, <laughs> until we were six. Yeah. You know, it was my. Grandkids keep groaning, you know, he's going to tell us all about the first banana he had. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every generation is different. Obviously, my grandparents, they fought in the wars and I loved them to bits. And, mm. But when in Glasgow, the, the bombings and Clyde Bank and trying to mm. bomb the ships, like they were going through it. They had All the lights were switched off. There was no electricity. Mm. 
when you see people struggle today, you think, what is it you're actually struggling about? Like, we've got it so good, but I don't know, again, if technology plays a massive part of people's mindset where it's slowing it down and everything's reels and different videos and constant of trying to portray a fake life to try and fit in with people who don't really care about you anyway. So even though it was more difficult probably to survive back then, especially with food, I just think now technology can damage mindsets as well where people can get stuck in a bubble. So everything changes through time and obviously we're guinea pigs for mobile phones and technology and radiation and all the stuff that comes from it. But it's just, this is why it's important these podcasts is to get an understanding of your life and what you went through and how you dealt with it and what you overcome. So was there much discipline in the boarding school then yes. for you yeah. to then yes. have used- purpose? One used to get beaten frequently. <laughs> Did you? Oh, yes. If what, for what reason? Um, if you didn't, if, if you failed to put in your homework, um, that, that would certainly get you caned. And, uh, I mean, if, if you were ever caught going down to the pub, you know, that would certainly be a very, very good caning. I remember once I, I um, bought my, um, I had a little two two air rifle that my grandfather had given me and, I bought that to school to shoot the pigeons. I was found out that earned me a caning as well. So, yeah, uh, it never did one any harm. I, I'd much prefer to be caned, or then, than put in my room for the day. It was only ever quickly, and mm-hmm. <laughs> you get on with life. Did anybody ever become more, not anti-authority, but against the system because they were getting caned? A lot of people, more people fragile towards it? Sure. I mean, there were, there, there, there were, but then on the whole, they, they were sensible and kept clear of, of the problems that might earn them that, that difficulty. But yet you never that. listened. <laughs> <laughs> you were going back for more punishment. What did you do after boarding school, David? Yes, I, I, went, in, I, I went into um, apprenticeship as a law, yes, which I found really exciting. My, I, I went in with my uncle, and he, he was the lawyer who defended Ruth Ellis, who was the last person, last woman to be hanged in England. Um, that damaged him enormously, uh, but he was a very, very good criminal lawyer. He had no hope to to save Ruth Ellis, of course, because she was caught pumping six bullets into someone. It was quite difficult to to defend. Of, uh, precisely, uh, so he he taught me um, criminal law, and I was able after my my apprenticeship um, to go into the courts which again was very exciting and uh, kept one on one's toes. So yes, then I went into private practice um, and uh, after about three years, I, I looked at the partner, the senior partner, the consultant and the guy who had just been put in the ground. I thought, this isn't for me, I need something more exciting. And my wife, Carrie, uh, bought me an advertisement which said they were looking for a legal advisor to the government of the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. And we looked at each other and said, well, let's go, which was, which was great. So I wound up in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, now, that, that was, was fascinating. The uh, time was the ministers there wanted to move away from what was fishing uh, in, into a tourism industry. And also at that time, they were setting up finance centers, what we call tax havens. And uh, my job there was to draft the legislation to help that happen. Very exciting time. Mm-hmm. Why did you never go down the, foots, the kind of same footsteps as your father, kind of military? Uh, I saw it, but also I, was, I wasn't really... Um, keen on that and he he was he was so in he the, didn't force that upon you then no not yeah. at all because i know you said you're going to do the but someone gave you the guidance to do law instead you're going to go down that route but yeah i i i wanted to do the law i think largely because my uncle was defending ruth ellis at the time and it was very exciting and i thought that that would be a great career to have mm-hmm. uh and that's what took me into the law my my father said you do what you want. So supportive then. Yeah. That's important. So see the woman who got hanged, the last woman to get hanged in mm. the UK was, what did she do? Shoot someone six times? She shot her lover. Yeah. Six times. He he was a, he, he was a, a bastard. No doubt about that. Uh, today, 
of course, she would have got away with manslaughter and been in for six months. I mean, he was so bad. But in those days, you didn't have a defense um, of diminished responsibility. So she, she was hanged, which was appalling. I mean, appalling. What year was this? 40s? 1957. It's still mad that... 53, yeah, 53, Only 57, a few yeah. years ago that people yes. used to get... Was it in the street or was it in court? She got hanged. How did it work back then? Oh, she... In, in prison. Was it in prison they hanged them? Yes. I know people used to get hang, hung in the streets and... Yeah, all that, yes, yes. I don't no, know if no, that was 1800s no, and no, shit. That was but pretty, it was pretty gruesome. So you ended up in the Cayman Islands? Ended up in Caicos Islands, Where was which that? is near, nearby the Cayman Islands, the bottom end of the Bahamas chain. And how was that experience? That that was extraordinary. I mean, first of all, the West Indians are wonderful, so one had an absolutely blissful relationship with them, which was which was great, friendly. Um, it was an open book to be able to um, help create the legislation for a tourist industry and 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 um, a finance centre which was really interesting. Then, of course, there were the Americans. There were two bases there. Um, one base was for the Navy SEALs. The other base was for the RAF satellite station. So we watched the moon landing there, which was pretty amazing, <laughs> actually in the satellite station. Uh, and um, we had trouble with the Cubans. Uh, and we also had a very strong... Uh, chief of police there uh and um i mean there's a sort of thing that would happen in turks was he, he came into my office and he said david he said, you got to come with me so i went out with him we went up to the airport and there was the um guy who used to run the local airline ran aztec to an engine aztecs he was an ex um bomber pilot low-level bomber pilot and uh, we climbed on board, and, and um, Andy said, uh, as we were going out, he said, we're going out because we've got a Cuban fishing boat fishing in our waters. Well, at that time, we were having a row with Cuba about who owned what as far as the, the, fishing, uh, um, the fishing area was concerned. Anyway, we went off, and I said to, to um, Andy, well, you know, what are we going to do? Because this guy won't have any number plate, as it were, we won't be able to land in the sea and do anything about him. He said, watch. Barclay took us in very, very low, and Andy had two packets of yellow dye <laughs> that he leaned out of the window and dropped. And he missed this boat. There was yellow dye everywhere. <laughs> the boat was absolutely untouched. Anyway, he told Barclay to go back and give a really low pass just to scare this guy. And all he got was the finger as we went by it from the captain of this fishing boat. So that was law enforcement in the Turks and Caicos Islands. How long were you there for? Two years. Another, another good experience then? Yeah, very, very good. Uh, huge learning curve to learn well, how to draft legislation for a start, how to... Uh, convert the uh, minister's wishes in, in, into law so that they got what they wanted. Um, and also to try and write in protections that uh, meant the tax haven wasn't going to be used for criminal purposes. That has never really been successful for any tax haven because, of course, they are used for criminal purposes. Yeah, it's still tax free, isn't it? Cayman yeah. Islands. Yeah. They're all tax free. So who own, who runs the Cayman Islands? Britain. So they're still run by British. Mm. Still mm. to this day. Mm. So yeah. why is that allowed then? Because there's always loopholes everywhere, and people find the loopholes. But that's always been the place for people to then take their money. Yes, it, it it's a very good point. Um, the islands themselves aren't self sufficient, so they need tourism and they need to be a financial um, offshore. There's nothing wrong with being a financial offshore because that enables um, corporations to deal with their, or international corporations to deal with their um, economy uh, sensibly and, and on an even keel. Um, the problem is how do you stop uh, money launderers, um, criminals, organized criminals, terrorists, using these islands 
The, um, there are international agreements, of course, which uh, govern the use of, of, of these islands. But nevertheless, it's almost impossible these days to ensure that you know exactly who is coming to deal in your island or what money they're putting through the books. There are various ideas that one has put on the plate. I, I spent oh, four years after I left the agencies dealing with um, tax havens on the basis of creating legislation to avoid the problems of money laundering. But uh, I, I can't see um, any particular way of stopping it altogether unless you just shut down tax havens. But is that not a good way then for, like you say, it's British, it's British rule, so is that a good way also for people who are putting big money in these offshore accounts to then get an understanding of who are they that's doing it? That may be the case. I wouldn't answer that question. Yeah, because it's pretty simple then for me looking at the outside of having these offshore accounts if there's loads of because it's the people who are cream of the crop but it's not your average guy here just trying to launder money a no. few thousand you're talking hundreds of millions yeah, possibly of billions um, so Adam, it's like banking system here there's red flags mm. if somebody gets more money than it should there's a phone from the bank that says look mm. where's that coming from or they'll froze your accounts which is understandable but there is it easy enough to set up or there's a lot of regulations that you have to go through, rules and regulations you have to go through to then set things up? Yes, yes, you have to. So it's not just a case of easy, going on a phone or an app or going out to no, a bank. No, you can't do that. Yeah, no, yeah, you, yeah. you have to show, you know, who, who exactly you are and where your money's coming from. Mm -hmm. the, the difficulty is with organised crime, of course, they, they employ lawyers, accountants, bankers, uh, anyone who's crooked in those fields to advise them on how to do it and how to get away with... with uh, bypassing the regulations mm -hmm. and for, for the organized criminals it, it is not that difficult obviously so what what did you do when you come back yeah, i was asked to go into the foreign office uh to be a lawyer there which um again that that that's another fascinating um life in the foreign office you're traveling all over the place you're meeting um people from all nationalities dealing with with different different aspects of international relations. I mean, for instance, I was asked to um, be the legal advisor for um, the British space program that we were kicking off then. That was way back in the days where satellites were just beginning. And uh, we had, um, I remember two, two international agreements I was involved in. One was the International Space Station, the agreement that, that governs the running of the International Space Station. Now, who would think there would be an agreement to govern it? But yes, there is, and it was quite complex. The other one was um, uh, for Inmarsat, when we were setting up the first Earth stations, governing how they were to be used, how communications were to come to the Earth station, and how the satellites were to be used. Very, very interesting stuff, cutting edge then. So who, yeah, who have you got to work with then? Because obviously if they're putting, sat anyone can put satellites up, there's got to be, also say if you get China, Russia, UK, America, has everybody got to be in agreement to how many satellites they can put up or is it a free for all that people can do what they want? Well, no, you, you, it, it, it is pretty much a free for all. I mean, you, you. There's thousands and thousands of well, there satellites are, yes. now. Yeah. And what's really interesting about that is um, one of my grandson's, his dissertation for his last year at, at uh, Swansea Uni because he's studying aerospace engineering his dissertation is how do you capture space junk and dispose of it safely so it's sort of full circle and we have a bit of a laugh because he looks at me and he thinks good grief he said you weren't really talking about that back then <laughs> probably blames you <laughs> <laughs> for, for creating yeah, it all, creating it all. It? yes so how how advanced was it back then though i always believe like i don't know i'm not in the know mm. of being in that society where, you, where you're in and you're working with it but i believe the government however it is are always 50 years 100 years possibly more ahead of the stuff that we get now what was the advance like with that technology then was it because obviously you can get the satellites now they can come down and mm. you can view people we've seen it now the, the proof is there but was it advanced then 70s was it no, no? not at all no I mean, uh, th th this wasn't long after Yuri Gagarin had made the first manned space flight. 
Mm -hmm. you know. So it, it was very unsophisticated. I mean, at the time, of course, it was the most sophisticated thing you could possibly think of. Watching the, the moon landing in in sixty nine, I think it was um, Armstrong. Oh, I mean, oh, that's just remarkable. I mean, this was way out of sight. Did you see this? Because there's a lot of people are skeptical that the moon landings were fake. Oh, I, w I was in the the U.S. Um, tracking station on Turks and Caicos, which actually followed the moon landing. I was there and watched it. So yes, I can say it was real. <laughs> That's mad, David, that yeah. you've witnessed that. Yeah, but like yeah, I yeah. say, people can make videos up now. Again, I'll, I'll stay open-minded to everything because I've never seen it with my own eyes, so mm -hmm. I'll always be sceptical. Sure. Like I say, I can never discredit anybody or I can never be 100% proof because I've never seen those things. But it's still intriguing. To, I would love to think the moon landings were real. I'd love to think they were bouncing about in space in the late 60s and... Obviously, with the technology now, I think our mobile phones have more technology in it than the spacecrafts that actually went to the moon. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking then when you seen someone on the moon? I was thinking this is just unreal. I mean, it was it was sheer excitement. I mean, the excitement in that room, uh, you know, in, in in the tracking station was immense. I mean, the Americans were just cock a hoo. It was a huge achievement for them. It was very exciting. Yeah. Why did they never send anybody back? I really don't know. I, I think I, I, I think that they found that very, very difficult. I mean, it, it, the cost is just immense. Uh, and if one looks at the cost of what what went into that then, I mean, pe people would cavil at that now. Mm -hmm. Because I know Musk is trying to get people to Mars. Mm. Do you think that's a possibility? Oh, I've, I've, Carrie and I have booked our place to Mars because we reckon that if, if Mars is populated, they're going to need built-in grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the technology and they know anyway how to make it last. What about, I know it's a bit of out there question, but what about UFOs, intelligence out there? Do you believe there's other species out there? There may very well be. I mean, I, I don't believe in UFOs. Um, I... I I, I've never seen anything that's convinced me a bit like you. I'd need to actually see it before I believed it. Whether or not there's life out there, there may very well be. There's no reason why there shouldn't be. Life puzzles me, if I'm honest, David. The, the anatomy, the brain, the central nervous system, the creator of how we are sitting here and mm. there's cameras and, and how it happens at this time. It just, if I think about it too much, if my mind can go. Yeah, then sure. sometimes I think, as, as humans, we can search too much and forget to actually just live yeah. because life is a beautiful journey. It's also very destructive as well. Obviously, we'll touch on that in the interview, but it puzzles me, life. It puzzles me how it's, why we're here, how we're here, who created us. Yes, and I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier, that, that the more you meet people, the more you travel, the more puzzled you get. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, 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 I was almost about to say it's easier, but actually it isn't. I, I, it, it's a joy to meet other people and, and travel and see how they live and how they all interact. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I think is the puzzle is how we manage to do it. And in fact, if you look at the way we live, although we've got major troubles at the moment, in fact, on the whole, we get on pretty well. Humans are de decent people. Yes. We are decent people. Mm, like, absolutely. if there's a catastrophe or earthquake, whatever, whatever, people, human beings' first instinct is to go and help. Mm. Like, we are good people. We can mm. get caught up in a society of, listen, you get beat up at school by the the teachers and stuff. That could send you in a different mm. outlook yes, in life. Like, yes. some students would imagine it would. Like, I've been speaking about this recently, but that you had the alcoholic father, you had twins. One became an alcoholic like his mm. father, another one couldn't even look at a drink because he didn't yes. want to be like his father. Yes. So it's yeah. everybody's got choices of, you never know where your circumstances of your upbringing either can really make you as a child, uh, make no. or break you, but it just puzzles me life. It puzzles yeah. it genuinely because I speak to so many different people mm. and it mm. puzzles me because you talk about meeting all these people and you go into all these, tri everything's tribalism. 
So when you get into all these different tribes and cultures, it's amazing how all these people people look different, they speak different, they dance different, yes. they're more welcoming than other people. It's just how everybody's traits are different. Hmm. Why do you ever think everybody can never just go on in life? Because we are all the same when you break it all down as yes. humans. Yes, I, I, <clears throat> I think... Genetics has obviously got a lot to do with 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 how you how you act. I'm I'm sure of that. I mean, I think. I mean, if you look back at boarding school, some people were able to to um, take the slings and arrows much easier than others. Why? It's got nothing to do with their upbringing. I mean, their their upbringing was probably the same as anybody else's. You know, they didn't go through a hard time being brought up. So I think I think there are genes that are in one. Um, particularly things like alcoholism and things like that i think i think that is genetic uh and i think that um the idea that one can sort of train um train oneself to be one way or another yes of course you can but it's quite difficult yeah do you believe in genetics dna things can get passed down of yes i do the same as the grandparents the uncles mm -hmm. because you've got instinct you have got mm. warriors out here. You have got leaders. You've got these guys in mm. big white horses and the sword and they're leading people into battle. You have mm. got these leaders now. Not so much they're leading people into battle, but they're winners. You've mm. got, they're just ingrained. They're born to win. They're born to lead. Do you Did you see that as well in your upbringing and the people you were surrounded with? You just knew that someone had, they were just born to lead? Yes. Yeah. Did you see that, feel yeah. that? Sure, certainly. You mm -hmm. did. And um, I think that that that's certainly true of the agencies too. Uh, I mean, the, the, these these people are born to um, go into dangerous situations, to handle those situations, come out even-minded, balanced, which is hugely important in the agencies. Keep their integrity, which is equally important. And yes, and. It, it, in a sense, the agencies look out for those qualities or, or attributes um, specifically to make sure that when people are put into the agencies, mm -hmm. that those attributes come to the fore. See, when you're in the Cayman Islands and you're working all this stuff and then you're seeing the moon landings, did you realise then, okay, this is what your life is about and that's what you wanted to do? No, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Still? Um, Yes, I, I, I think it, it, it was the excitement of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've, I've been lucky in the sense that the law's um, given me a, a really, really adventurous life. I've done all sorts of jobs that have been exciting. Um, I think it's exciting being a lawyer, uh, providing you keep a, a sense of balance. How do you do that, though? You have to stand back. And again, I think if you are, and I go back to this, if... if if you're lucky enough to sort of not be under parental influence all the time and to be slung into a boarding school where you have to look after yourself, one of the things you absolutely need is a sense of balance. Because I know a lot of I've had QCs on and lawyers and they never really seem to switch off. The, the one, when they're working, they go home with their work. It's always non-stop and they just love the craft and the job mm. and that sense of, listen, it's a sense of power as well. You've got someone's life in your hands. Did you feel that? No, no, I never, I never felt that because I think if, if, if one allows oneself to think that, you become unbalanced. Mm -hmm. You either become too cautious because you're worried about the fact that you have got someone's life in your, in, in your hands, or you become overconfident, you know, power. What makes a good lawyer? Balance. Is that what it all comes down to? Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to stand outside your client and look at them um, coldly, balance up the pros, the cons. And that was really important in the, in, in the agencies and, and also in the foreign office when you're dealing with Russians and Americans. I mean, if, if ever you go into a, 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 a meeting with, with Russians or, or, or Americans in terms of moving towards an agreement, make absolutely sure that when everybody sits down and says, oh, we've reached that agreement, you still have one more document in your 
briefcase to be able to hand back because the Americans and the Russians will always have one more point after everybody thinks the agreement's finished. Yeah. That's why we've probably got so much destruction right now because there's nobody's <laughs> coming to an agreement. Do you think? What is that? Is yeah. that tactics? Is it ego? Is it pride? What is that? Tactics. Is that what it is? Yeah, sure. Because I actually watched the Putin interview. Did you see, Did you watch it? His interview done last week. You done an interview with Tucker. I and uh, he says he had an agreement in place. Mm -hmm. It was the Americans that pulled out last minute or something and says no. Yeah. Is that correct? That could be. I don't know. I mean, I don't. That's know. what Putin says from his own mouth. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I don't trust a word of what he says. <laughs> so, what happens then when you come back, Cayman Islands? You hmm. worked for the. What was it like working in the Foreign Office? That that was very exciting. As I say, a meeting meeting with with people, de dealing with issues that that were absolutely fascinating, defence issues um, at that time, uh, sort of. Did a lot of work with the Americans countering drugs, which was where I first met met up with the FBI, uh, which, which was absolutely fascinating. Did a lot of human rights work, which is something that we talk about a lot now, but back then, human rights really wasn't um, understood terribly well. We we talked about balance of fairness, but of course, we it became far more sophisticated. Now you have a right to life. Um, you have a right to freedom of speech, but that right can be curtailed if it leads to crime, um, that sort of thing. I think that uh, the balances now aren't, aren't properly understood. Um, I think the balance, the rights also have equal responsibilities, and I'm not quite sure that we have got the hang of the responsibilities that we need to balance up rights in how many cases. Yeah. How bad is the drug trade? Because cocaine, if you go back to the the plant, the cocaine, the coca, is it, what's the plant called? Co coca. Coca plant. So you go back to the coca plant, it's been here for, I think, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Mm. They used to use it in like ceremonies and mm. they've had it in Coca-Cola and obviously now they've changed that. I think it mm. became... Yes, bad in the 70s yes but how big is the the drug trade so obviously it's we'll touch on human trafficking which has probably overtook the drug trade but how big and is the trade and drugs all around the world how organized is that obviously you had pablo escobar and other guys from mm. the south american side of things but obviously you've worked on it firsthand how big is this trade it is uh, the, the interesting thing recently is uh because the the, the program of eradication of drugs in Colombia and places like that, of the coca leaf, has, was stopped. There's now a sort of glut of cocaine on the market, and, and therefore more cocaine is, is coming through. The, the interesting thing I've heard is that, that certainly the younger generation aren't particularly keen on, on drugs. The, the younger generation, um, the, I, th I think the biggest users are sort of... Um, 20s to 30s, you know, uh, for, for social recreation, for, for cocaine. Yeah. Um, the price of uh, cocaine has gone right down recently because of the glut. Um, interdictions of, of, of drugs have gone up because there's more, more flying around the place. I think, again, on, it, when one talks about the social use of, of cocaine, uh, I'm not really sure that the users quite understand what they're getting into, apart from the fact that it, medically, of course, it doesn't do you much good. Mm -hmm. But what they don't understand is when they hand over, I don't know, 50, 60 quid um, for cocaine, uh, that that 50 or 60 quid is going straight into the pockets of an organized crime organization. And that money will help that organization continue to produce drugs at the same time as keeping people in order. 
So what you're looking at is there is a almost direct correlation between the cash that goes into an organized crime organization via your street dealer, goes to that organization, goes to people who are being murdered, killed, tortured. So when people take their line, they're not thinking about that. They're not thinking, oh my God, actually this money is going into something that's absolutely appalling and yeah. keeping it going. Why not legalize it then? You could legalize it. They've tried legalizing marijuana, haven't they, in the States with pretty disastrous results. They tried it in Amsterdam. Uh, I don't, I don't see that legalizing it does much good. I think that the the future will probably lie with with this new generation that's coming through the younger generation that are actually thinking it's just not cool. Yeah, I they want that, to keep yeah. their mind free. active yeah. and free. I think that's what we need. It needs to be taught mm. is it's not cool. It's damaging towards the brain. It's damaging mm. to the people around you. You become a shittier person. You become a shittier mm. husband, shittier father, shittier brother, mm. shittier son. Like mm. anything, because I think it was a is it Sigmund Freud? Freud was his the guy in the eighteen hundreds because the cocoa plant he was getting benefits from it mentally, mm. but I think then people were taking mental breakdowns as well. So everything grown from there. You get the the heroin plant. You've got heroin, yes. cocaine, yes. the poppy fields. But it's how you manipulate it mm. into what it does to the, the mind. Because I've I've spoke to drug lords. I've been on the podcast. Yeah. They says we're putting tires on it. Mm. Um, which causes cancer sure. to the brain, yes. um, cement, rat it's poison. All cut. Yes. Yeah, it's all cut. So you're not even getting proper cocaine. No. By the time it comes to the streets, it's only like 10, it 20% yes. of the shit that people are snorting. But again, it's a big business. Mm. Did you, what was it like then working with the FBI? Did you know what you were getting yourself involved with? Yes, that was interesting. I mean, the first the first case, funnily enough, I had was in Turks and Caicos Islands. And, and there was some... Um, a businessman there who who had built a huge house on the edge of the sea, uh, gold plates in on the taps and things like that. You know, we got interested in him. Uh, we knew that if we tried to prosecute this particular person in the Turks and Caicos Islands, he was so powerful there that probably wouldn't get a jury conviction. So uh, we asked the FBI to come in. They sent in an agent that they used. Um, countering narcotics in in uh, ecuador i think it was and uh, that was the first time i saw an operation go radically wrong we sent him in with a wire to meet up with this uh, uh businessman uh, on the pretext of introducing a new line of um coca to come through the islands by air and uh he, he was met on the doorstep of this magnificent house and the businessman said, oh, we'll come out outside and we'll have a rum punch. Goes outside, there he is on the terrace overlooking the sea. The wind had turned northwest. We couldn't hear a thing on, couldn't hear a thing on the wire. Just shook up the sea coming in. <laughs> what were you thinking then? Was this, was this a drug lord? This was a drug lord that we'd sent our, our or the FBI had sent their um, informant into, yeah, yeah. Why did he not... Pat he's down for a wire why was he so confident that he's weren't wired it, it's extraordinary yeah and, and that goes down to the um success of the informer lulling the businessman into thinking that he really was a guy who wants to come in and, and sell a line to um to this guy to, to bring through the island is that what makes a good agent yes, 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 yes. trust yes where you can walk in with a wire without any paranoia. Absolutely. Mm. It's, it's, a, ma it's mad in it how mm. people can, like as I've had so many undercover police officers on, yeah. it blows my mind yeah. how cold they can be because the guy I had on, his, his podcast actually out in Thursday, he was an undercover gangster. Mm. Listen, if I'm honest and I says to him, I was always raised to hate the police because him, all my uncles, they were all dodgy bastards. <laughs> right, Do you yes, know what I mean? Yes, so they're always, yes, we course. did hate them because they were out to get them, but you get grew up to hate them. But then, Obviously, you realise the job that they do is unbelievable. Mm. The stuff that they see every day from the deaths and every, it's a negative job and they've seen a lot of pain and 
I've nothing but respect for them for what they do now. It's took me many years to actually realise what these pe people do mm. in their life and the sacrifices mm. that they have to do mm. to try and keep the, the world in running order. Mm. Of course we need laws or else it would be a free-for-all out mm. there because people are scatty. Mm. But he went undercover as a gangster, befriended this guy for two years mm. and it was just about to pull the, pull the plug on the guy and the guy asked him to be the godfather of his son. Like, that's some dark yeah. shit yeah. To, to pretend to it's like getting a bad wife mm. who's just fucked you for your money and it's just pulled the will over your eyes for years and you believed mm. all her shit but I feel as if for a man it would be harder to feel that you had a brother and then to find out it was all an act mm. it mm. must be difficult um, because I remember watching the movie Donnie Brasco I don't know oh, how, yeah. how real it was but you've got to be some cold bastard as well to then do that life that's a because any sort of blown your cover you're dead mm. you're not working with some two bob asshole who's on the streets you're working with the top the cream of the crop who mm. kill for fun like were you, were you nervous going into that job well i i was uh, because uh, being a lawyer yeah i wasn't actually i mean i went yeah. on to an operation in order to find out how, how they operated how it in northern ireland once but it wasn't my job to go out on operations mm -hmm. because there again, you can get skewed. You've got to stand back. Uh, but obviously, one, uh, 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 as a lawyer in five and six, one, one, one was involved in operations in order to um, A, keep them legal, which is a curious thing to have to say, but mm -hmm. yes, because the, if, if you're operating against people, it had to be necessary to do it and proportionate you know, what you were doing was proportionate. Never ceased to impress me, and one felt incredibly privileged working with these um, agents, you know, men and women, officers who, who went out meeting um, these um, incredibly bad people, winning them over, winning their confidence, getting the information that was necessary. Yeah, yeah very impressive people indeed. So see, when <clears> you're the lawyer behind the scenes, Hmm. Do you, have you got to brief them for what to say and where they've got to be because obviously you, there's a lot of red tape and certain areas they can be in certain areas they can gather information and evidence did you have to go through everything where where they could travel where they could be like so obviously if you're British you can't really go to America unless you've got clearance to then there's all work. that sort of stuff if you've got to go through everything because if hmm. they go to court and there's one thing hmm. I missed they could get the court case through yep. out so have you got to be specific yes. on certain things that they can do and, and be when they're on a job. Incredibly difficult too. And, that, and there again, one, one was always impressed about how they worked under those conditions because one of the problems um, in, in bringing um, a case to court, and that if, if, if one really wants to, to get to the end game, that's what it's all about, trying to bring people to court. I mean, okay, fine, there are different different aspects these days in terms of trains and all the rest of it but the objective would be to get the the um, criminals into court and prosecute them you're now dealing with intelligence which is secret and you're then having to translate that secret intelligence into open evidence in open court now that's quite a tricky business because uh, what you have to do is to anticipate what evidence you can get into court that the defense, A, isn't going to challenge, so it's got to be good evidence leading to a prosecution, leading to a successful uh, result. Second, you have to make sure that there's nothing that you're hiding that might help the defense. So when you're planning an operation, you have to plan it so not only do you get the information to convict, but also you're not getting information that would be useful to the defense that could open up a whole line of inquiry to them that would help them in, into another operation. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult, very tricky. And the um, officers themselves who, who, who went into these operations were, were, were so good because they had to hold all that in their minds apart from the fact you're meeting with an agent in a dangerous situation, or alternatively, you're entering into a property planting a bug in an equally dangerous situation, they had to come out, write up reports, not only about the intelligence aspect, 
but also about the evidential aspect so that when you went into court, you could show exactly what they'd been doing, but hiding the secret stuff that didn't help the defence. Mm -hmm. So you're not just that all yeah, makes. but you're not just an average lawyer. You're not someone who's going to the courts. You're working all around the world. It must have been some buzz for you. Did you realise what you were involved in, or was it just a normal day to day thing for you? Yeah. Did you know? It was. It was day to day. Yeah. Yeah. And were you buzzing from it, or were you just taking it like any other job? No, you have to take it serious. You, you, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was fascinating. I mean, one felt privileged. You know, every day you went into the office, you were privileged because you were working with people who were so incredibly good. So that was a huge privilege. You were privileged because you were working with <clears throat> the law in a way where you were creating situations, um, sting operations, that sort of thing. Is this the elite? The best of the best working kind in these environments. Oh, the, the, yeah, if you're looking at people like MI5, MI6, I mean, you, you've you met the SAS. And, yeah, uh, yeah. They are the elite. CIA. Absolutely. Uh, CIA, Because yes. the guy from the CIA, he was just a university guy. Mm. Well, so he mm. says, listen, you've got to take everything with a pinch of salt. Same as, because you, you're, you're, you're so in that life, you can feed me whatever information you want. Mm. You're obviously very good at it, but mm. I understand mm. it as well how it works and you can feed people what they want, but... He was CIA, and I can only go what he was saying. He was top his class in university. Mm. He got pinched from his university because they were looking at everybody's score sheets yes. and they were recruiting. They weren't just some special forces guy, some macho man. Mm. This was a nerd mm. from university, Absolutely. top his class. He recruited, and he thought it was a joke. Yeah, He thought it was some sort of joke. That's what he says, but I'd imagine that works. They're just getting the best of the best and seeing what they can get from them. Is that how it works yeah. with the sort of intelligence here as well? Yeah. I mean, funnily enough, one, one of the reasons I've written about a female um, agent in, in, in the books is... Yeah, is, what is this new bit? We'll plug it as well. Yeah, no, uh, but I, I, I was actually going to say that, that if, 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 you, if you look at it, I know my, my youngest granddaughter who, who actually got me into writing these books because she asked me down to her school to talk about spies. <laughs> but she reminded me so much of, of um, the officers in the agencies of very, very talented, very bright, but you wouldn't want to meet them on a hockey field. <laughs> you know? mm. It's that sort of dual, dual edge. Yeah. What is your book, David? The Russian spy one now? What is the, what people can buy it? Oh uh, yeah, that's Katya. Katya uh, is the first book, and that deals with a Russian um, intelligence agent. In in the first book, she's the uh, chief operations officer of an organization called the G Eight Intelligence Agency. A guy called Cartwright, who was um, President Gaddafi's money launderer. President Gaddafi was the Libyan president who was killed. He was not a very nice guy, and Cartwright goes off with half a billion of Gaddafi's private personal fortune. Uh, Katya is, her father was a KGB officer who was a real, real swine. He, he forced her into the agent, in, into the um, intelligence world. On the other hand, her mother was a, a ballet dancer who had a very glamorous life, and Katya's completely conflicted. On the one hand, she's forced into the intelligence world, which she rather enjoys, but on the other, she'd love the glamour of her her mother's life. So she is then asked to go and find this half billion dollars. Cartwright is protected by Ahmed and a group of very, very senior international terrorists. So she's got to go through them, which is totally terrifying, of course. Then she enters the world of money laundering, which is wholly corrupt and depraved. I mean, really nasty people operate in that world. They really do. Uh, so she goes out to Panama to find to find out where the money's gone, and then winds up in Ambergris, which is a tax haven run by a series of corrupt ministers. Uh, and of course, she has a love affair there. The question, of course, is: you know, does she go off with him, or does she go off with the money? Like a treasure hunt. Like a treasure hunt. Where can people buy your book, David? They can buy it on Amazon, Waterstones, and uh, Hatchards, I think, bookstores. We'll leave a link in the description. So, MI5, MI6, yes. intelligence, 
How does one get involved with MI5 and MI6? How does it come about, David? Yeah, I, nowadays it's um, you, you can apply. It's all on the website. If you're interested in the agencies, you you apply. They advertise for 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 officers. Um, I, I I was very lucky because I'd been involved in defence work in the Foreign Office, and also I'd been involved in dealing with um, the Americans on on counter you know counter narcotics. And as I said earlier, the, the there was a sea change in moving from the Cold War to um, counterterrorism, and they needed a, a sort of different view from from the legal point of view. It needed to be more legal rather than um, illegal, if you see what I mean. Uh, because you cannot prosecute terrorists unless everything is, as I said earlier, everything is straight up and down. You've got to be able to go to court and show that they are truly guilty and you're not hiding anything. So uh, I was asked to go in and help with the change, which was very lucky. It was a perfect time to go in. Another blank sheet of paper, if you like. What's the difference between MI5 and MI6? MI5 operates in within the jurisdiction. MI6 operates outside the jurisdiction or outside the country. But of course, these days, international terrorism, international organized crime, it, it's all international. So in a sense, there's a, 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 a cover over both. And of course, they have joint um, organizations that, that operate to to um, bring together both agencies doing their work. How powerful are they, MI5? Because obviously you've got your Russians, you've got your Americans, you've got your Chinese. How Are we up there with intelligence mm -hmm. or is everybody kind of under the same umbrella? Is there one better than another? No, I think they're all under the same umbrella. I think so. But yeah, I do think so, yeah. So the the standard is, is, is as I said earlier, is incredibly high. So yes, they, they all operate together, and that, that doesn't exclude GCHQ either. So what's it like then being in that environment? What can you talk about? Like How does it operate, your daily routine? Is it? Do you get a different job every day? Are you on one for months? How does it work? Well, it can be. I mean, some people are on them for months because you, the, these are long-term investigations. So uh, you have teams operating, obviously, mm -hmm. and... Um, from my perspective, no day was the same because one was doing all sorts of different operations. One was dealing with legislation. Uh, one was dealing with, with the human rights aspects. So that was a very exciting life as a lawyer, very interesting life. Mm -hmm. Because I've interviewed enough police officers now to understand the police know everything, especially with informers, especially with all the intelligence that mm -hmm. they've got now. MI5 is a whole different level. Like, is the whole world kind of looked upon? Is everything kind of understood? Because obviously if you've got these criminal activities and terrorism, as a lot of intelligence know what's really going on everywhere, or can still people still fly under the radar? Because even though there's terror terrorism everywhere, there's not been many attacks. In the UK, is that because of how good the intelligence is? Or is it just because there's only been a few terror attacks in the UK, and there shouldn't be any, of course, but with lost lives, is that because there's not happening all the time because of how good the intelligence mm. is here? It is. That, that, that is quite simply the answer. Is that, that how? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And if... If there, if there wasn't here, sorry to interrupt, but if there was no MI5, MI6, do you think there would be terror attacks every day? Well, I wouldn't say that, but there would be a lot more. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Uh, they are... The tentacles spread, stretch wide, um, and and they are very very good at their job. There's nothing worse. There's no worse feeling in, in the office if a terrorist attack gets through. I mean, it, it it is you know that that really is a downing time. Um, people feel dreadful that something's got through that perhaps they should have seen or could have seen. Um, but if you look at it, there's a finite amount of money to support MI5 and MI6. <clears throat> there's a budget. And unlike James Bond, where there doesn't seem to be a budget at all, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to work within the budget. And that literally means that you may be um, studying a particular target and... Uh, 
it's been going on for a long time. There might be something out there, might not be. Along comes another target that might be more important. You may have to give up the first target. And that's the target that might come back and bite you. Because you just don't have the money to do everything. See, I thought there'd been a free-for-all as well, where like, there was no money wouldn't be an issue. Of course it is, yeah. That's mad, isn't it? it is because mad. especially with the intelligence that you could mm. get to save potentially thousands of lives, mm. where there's not enough funding. I know mm. the funding of the police and stuff is terrible now, and mm. they're, they're dropping down numbers. Could that be? Could that have an effect on crime in the future with not enough funding for people to protect and serve? Yeah, I think I think what will happen is there will be. I mean, for instance, we don't use. Um, Telephone intercept as evidence. Every other jurisdiction in the world uses telephone intercept as evidence. That's listening in defense. Well, you can say, well, of course, nobody talks on the phone these days because they all know they might be listened into, but nevertheless, they do. It's just one of those facts mm -hmm. of life. The reason we can't use or we don't use intelligence, um, t telephone intercept as, as evidence is or has been the cost because you have to bring together everything that is listened to. And if you go to court, that all has to go to court and be sifted through. It costs a load of cash. I think what we may see in the future is AI will solve that problem because it'll be able to deal with the huge amounts of, of, um, of intelligence that, that's secured by telephone intercept and translated in a way in which it can go to court in far more cheaply than it can at the moment. So I think AI is going to be incredibly useful in the future for intelligence work, yes, and, and hopefully that that will solve part of the uh, financial problem. When did you find out about AI? I have a friend who's working in the States very closely with um, The Hill on AI. He's in uh, Hopkins uh, university. Uh, so we've been talking about it for a year or so. Yeah, because I had a man called Mo Goddard on. Mm. He worked for Google. Mm. He created the AI. He was one of the ones who created that really? over 10 years ago. Fascinating. And he said within the next five to 10 years, AI is going to be one billion times smarter than any human. Yeah. That's fucking scary. Does it's, that not scare you, David? Or, no, I think it's wonderful. Or do you think that's a good thing for, like you say, not cutting mm. corners, but getting to the the results and the answers faster than anyone yeah. could potentially, because I said to him, could they potentially then rule the world? Um, mm. He says no. He says it's not going to be like a Terminator where they're going to be in the streets mm. and robots, but he says it's so powerful that it's going to have a big say in how the world is operated mm. because it, it doesn't want to, it's just, it's a machine. I think we could be machines also. We could be avatars or aliens. Like, like I say, I still don't know. I don't have the answers. Maybe you do, but I feel as if we're machines anyway. Well, I think, hasn't Elon Musk just planted, implanted a chip? In the brain. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now you see people walking about with goggles yes. and they're in different other metaverses. And that there must be a true source to what we've come from. Maybe, mm. again, this is another sort of metaverse. Maybe we, we pass here, we go back to the true source of what created us. I, I genuinely, again, mm. I don't know, just from the people who I interview mm. and try and get an understanding of life. If I'm honest, nobody really knows what the fuck is going no. on. No. Nobody's ever gave me a concrete answer, no matter if it's CIA, SES, a school teacher, mm. a homeless man, the billionaire. Mm. Nobody's, there's nobody really, we're just kind of going through life, trying to go through it on a journey unscathed. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I, I don't, don't look at me for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping you had some secret ball with all the some. answers and some Einstein <laughs> yes. bits of paper down there that who created us. I've got the answer. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But Someone I think, must yeah. have the answers. There must be in the archive somewhere where it's all started. It's got to be. You must have something, David Boy. Tell the people what they want to know. Who's created <laughs> us? Who wears the UFOs? Is uh, It's just fascinating. Like, yeah. even having you on, it's just fascinating because you're very well spoken, but it's clear you're a very well respected man to get to the level you've got. If, I, you're, if you're building a team, you want you in the team because you're very loyal to the cause. And that's very rare to find these days. Well, it's kind of you to say that. I, I don't say it that way at all. I just look at my life and think how incredibly lucky I've been. You know, I've been married for 60 years. You know, that is lucky. 
Isn't that amazing? I think Other people might think different, Dave. I can't even keep a, a girl for 60 minutes. I need to take a, a leaf out of your book. Is, uh, yeah. But uh, are you British through and through, David? Yeah. Yes, I am, actually. Yes. I mean, not, not that that matters. I don't care, you know, what, what, what I'd be, actually. I, d I don't see race at all. Um, as I say, you know, going all the way back to those very early days, Fucking about with Brazilian kids on the beach playing football, mm -hmm. you know. Do you think that gives you a good understanding of humans, though, that yeah. we are actually all good because you've touched on a lot of different places and different people's cultures and backgrounds? Mm. Because, like you said, British through and through, it's just been we spoke about the Americans, they're very mm. patriotic. Like, yes. World War Three starts, you have the majority of them signing up mm. because they love America. I mean, they sing their national yes. anthem, there's pride yeah. with them. Britain, I'm not so sure. I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I believe we're still a very strong nation. I don't think we like to profess ourselves to be British, do yeah. we? I yeah. mean, we, we, we much prefer to sort of hide all that and just get on with it. You know, I mean, I, I, I do agree with you. I, you know, I've worked closely with, with Russians and, and, I mean, Russians in, in, in particular and, and, uh, Got on with enormously well. Of course, one part of your brain is saying, yeah, well, okay, fine, I've got to be careful about this. Um, but they're human beings just like us. And if you don't talk to them, you're not going to break through barriers. I mean, I, I, I look at the situation we have at the moment with Putin, who's incredibly dangerous, and we, we have to do absolutely everything we can to keep him at bay and to keep the Ukrainians fighting and, and give as much as we possibly can to the Ukrainians. Um, but there are Russians here that want to be here. I think we can perfectly easily chat to them, get with them. There are Russians in Russia who don't want the life that they have. And I think by any extent possible, we should try and reach out to them. Incredibly difficult because of media's shut down in, 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 in Russia. But I think that uh, rather than sort of cancelling each other and non-platforming each other over here, we might sort of start thinking about what we could do about talking to Russians and discuss what democracy might be to them as apart from us. I mean, I think they must look at us thinking, here you talk about free speech, and, and yet you don't allow people to come and speak their minds. I mean, I'm not talking about criminality, you know, people being going off the deep end, extremists. Uh, they must find that really rather odd, I think. What happened with Ukraine and Russia? What's the, how did it all start? Space. Because obviously, you Crimea. Both. What about NATO as well? Was that going closer to Russia, or was that an excuse to then target I, Ukraine? I, I, I don't think so. I, I think Putin was in deep trouble economically um, at home, and he he wants to expand. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And th this is to the glory of Imperial Russia, isn't it? I mean, he's gone back there. When you talk about expand, you're talking about Hitler trying to. Of kind course. of take over the world is that a possibility where world war three can start if how and how sorry two questions but how big is russia russia with china because that's two powerful forces as well can they be stopped if they come close together well again i mean i don't have any answers to that i, I one looks back at china russia relations and they've always been up and down have they hmm. yeah i don't really know i'm just going for what i'm seeing yeah, they've always been up and down yeah um, and, and again, I mean, I think we can frighten ourselves to death. I think I think we need to keep we need to keep in mind the fact that we need to be strong, and that means money for our armed forces. But that's got to be done, um, and for the intelligence agencies. Uh, and on the other hand, I think we need to remember that hearts and minds is just as important as going to war got to reach out uh to to people yeah that fa interview was fascinating with putin he did say that he wanted an agreement everybody sat down they're ready to sign it him and Zelensky, and it was america who says no it was so he says but again i don't know i don't know i'm, I'm not 
intelligent enough to have the answers. I can only listen to people and go, well, it makes sense. But again, Ukraine, what have they had? 15 billion, 100 billion. Like, when does it ever stop for peace? Do you think there'll ever be peace? Because there's always wars, David, from the patterns that I see in the books that I read. There's always wars, there's always chaos, there's always destruction. And do you ever think there'll be peace on earth where people don't need to fight? Or do you think that's just part of human beings? I think it's part of human beings. I think it goes back to what we were talking the DNA. about earlier, genes and DNA. You know, there will always be greedy people. There will always be people who want to be more powerful than others. It's something we have to put up with. Do you think that's what it comes down to, greed and power? It's sad, but isn't it, when human beings lose lives. And like you've probably seen and heard and you've been under it where you've seen people, things that the news don't put mm -hmm. on or they, 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 they don't print. But again, is it all about peace and love? I don't know, but if you go back to the scriptures for thousands of years, it's always been destruction. It's always been power. It's always been people trying to take control. What does that come down to? Is that ego is that madness in the mind or do, again when we come back to the dna thing where it's just a natural thing for people to try and lead yes i think it comes down to thinking you are right i am right i think you know we're seeing that and i know i go back to this cancelling people out and non-platforming that's done because people think i am right this person doesn't have a view well, that's exactly what leads to war and, and unhappiness. What do you think of Israel and Palestine? Incredibly difficult. I, I mean, if you look at the balance of rights there, uh, the um, Israel obviously has the right to self-defense, must do. And that's got to be looked at in the sense that um, Hamas, uh, the credo of Hamas is the elimination of Israel and everybody in it. So you, you start from that aspect, and then from your Hamas point of view, you're looking at Israel that's creating difficulties in the West Bank, you know, trying to grab land, and um, their view going, going all the way back to the beginning that Palestine should never have been split up. I don't have any truck with terrorism because that's not a solution to anything. Um, as far as Israel is concerned, the Hamas have a right to life, um, but that right to life is is forfeit in cer in, in in circumstances where it's um, necessary to defend yourself and your reaction on your actions against the terrorist are proportionate. <clears throat> So that's the balance that, that Israel have to look at. The, the, the huge difficult question these days is that armaments and things are, are, are directed at specific targets, but you do have this collateral damage, which is a horrific thing to, to look at. I don't know the answer, and I think the only people who would know or would be able to reach some answer are those people actually on the ground looking at what's going on from an independent perspective, um, UN in, 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 in particular. Because unless you're on the ground and you know exactly what's going on, you, you can sit in an armchair and proselytize and, and talk about these issues, but you won't reach proper, you won't reach what I would consider a fair conclusion. Who's Britain's biggest threat? Russia. Has it? Mm. Could they, how, if they get a lot of nuclear weapons, Russia? Yes, of course. Mm. What happens if people just started, is that a possibility or is it a lot more where people can't just press buttons and start firing missiles? Like, could that happen or is that far-fetched? Well, I went through, the, you know, the era of, uh, of um, the Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, where, where that threat existed. Uh, I think the the view that I took then, and I still take, is who really wants to set off a nuclear war when you know you're going to be wiped out yourself? So it's suicide, basically. Mm. Is there intelligence for people to see missiles coming from a distance? 
or can missiles fly under the radar with some special no you've got I, airplanes that can yeah. fly under the radar um, but I don't know about missiles like I say I no, genuinely don't know I, not, I, I don't know enough about that no. so see mm. when you're working MI5 MI6 like <clears throat> is every day just a, a new day a different day yes yeah absolutely I mean you can be you, you'd start off with a wash up with, with the lawyers um, working out what they're doing and um, getting their advice as to what might happen or, or talking through cases talking through legislation, talking through the balance of rights, and you might be off to talk to um, a, a team of officers about a particular operation how it might be working out and um, trying to help them out. Uh, then you might be going off to one of the department's home office or foreign office to talk about working out how, how to create legislation for some particular aspect, for instance, running informants, which is very, very tightly controlled. Uh, then off to the D Director of Public Prosecutions to talk about a prosecution that might be going on. Yes, I mean, it, it, it was varied and interesting. See, if there's no intelligence like MI5, MI6, CIA, do you think the world would have been more turmoil than more it is? Yes, 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 of course. How important is it to have intelligence around the world? I think it's absolutely vital. One, one has to know, as far as one possibly can, what the bad people are doing. Do you get like a, a script of someone? How does it work? So see, you've got some new terror group that's starting. Do you get wind of that? And see if you're reading about someone and their plans to come. Like who, my method of thinking, how you could come is anywhere and hurt innocent children or hurt people and blow themselves up and it, it, is, it does puzzle me that mm. how brainwashed you can be like see when you're getting that intelligence of people want to do that and kill innocent people kill your own what mm. what do you think then does that make you sad to the world or is it just a case of you try and be cold towards it and like you mm. say is to find the balance of mm. you're just doing a job because then you've got grandkids you've mm. got kids yeah they become anybody that hurts my kids. I know I would die for them. I would kill mm. for them. It's, it's not big man talk. It's just yeah. natural. But yeah. as a, any father or any man should be a protector. But see, when you're gathering that information of people want to hurt your own, how would, how do you deal with that? Well, the, the first thing you have to do is if if you get wind of of somebody a target, which you call a target, uh, then you you have to look into that particular snippet of information. Before you even make up your mind that this is a firm target, you have to get collateral information so that you can cross-reference it to make sure that this person is actually somebody who, who may very well be bad. Um, so therefore, it's going to be necessary to look into them. Then you have to work out, well, how bad are they? What What's proportionate? You know, Do we tap their telephone? Do we do this or that? Uh, and the case is built, and, and it takes time. So is everything precise where it takes time and you don't make decisions straight away? No, it's very, very precise, very, very well closely planned. Yes, you don't go off half-cocked like James Bond rushing off into the blue with your Walter PPK and <laughs> knocking <laughs> off the baddie. Yeah, <laughs> that's what the little guy from the CIA says. He says it's not like this fucking drinking martinis and standing with suits on. They're dressed like little nerds and they're standing places just gathering information for months at a time, mm. isolated, mm. away from everybody. Mm. Nobody knows nothing. Mm. See, when you're doing that job as well, if you got to, do you judge people? Do you get taught how to look at people's mannerisms, breathing yes, the, techniques, the, the, posture? The officers do. It's all part of the training. And training is a massive. Uh, I mean, they're constantly in training. Are you learning every day? All the officers. Learning every day? Learning every day. Are these guys trained to kill? Are the SES guys involved as well? Like people who get sent off secret missions, people who are top of the tree? Well, the, the um, I mean, SAS is a sort of different. Different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, the, their training is, is obviously different. They're unbelievable. Like, <clears throat> I have nothing but respect for what they, these mm. guys up here mm. is different. Mm. The way they handle things, the way that mm. they've seen things and how cold they are. Mm. Like, that's, I know a lot of people can struggle with PTSD, and mm. but these guys are born different. Do you think a lot of people are born to be like that, to be trained and mm. given orders to then go out and do anything? 
Or do you believe you can be trained into being something like that? No, as I, I say, I, th I think it goes back to DNA. Do you think so? Mm, I, I do. Um, I, th I think, yes, it, 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 they're special people. That's why they call it special people. forces, isn't it? They are, yeah, yeah. When you do the tests and that, and a lot of these boys, it's not the big strong men who who finish no, 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 first. No, 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 no. They tend to see they're the ones that have broken it. No. Do you think it's more in here? Hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you look at the agencies and there are people with first-class degrees, you know, and they'll go out meeting agents, mm -hmm. you know. Is it, see the, is it that, the MI6 building there, the big green? Yeah, that's that's the MI6. Is that where you, you went in and what? Yeah, I, I used to work, but from both, because MI5 MI5 was the MI6. other side of the, the terms. Yeah. What's it like walking in? Does it, uh, did you just love what you've done? <laughs> when I first, when I, when I walked in. does it just become, did the novelty wear off? When, when MI5 set up their building across the Thames, because mm -hmm. it was a new building, we used to work in another building, and I, I went in for the first time, and they had the new uh, security cubicles. You walk in, and the door closes behind you and won't open up until you're let through. And it wouldn't open up. I said, why didn't it open up? They said, you're too heavy. <laughs> 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 so they slightly recalibrated that. <laughs> uh -huh. Because you're what you're about six three six height. No, I, was, six. I was six three. Yeah, you shrunk with old age. I shrunk with old age. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a lot of stuff that we don't see on the news and in newspapers that we don't hear that a lot of these people stop the intelligence that you never hear about? Of course, you see absolute minimum amount. Do you look at the average person, guy like myself, or people who just walk about the street who are oblivious and sometimes maybe envious because they don't actually know what's going on, or would you? Do you just think, okay, that was just the job that you took on? I think I'm unimaginative. I don't, it doesn't strike me Face like you. that at all. No. I mean, I, 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 one thinks one's privileged to work with the officers themselves. I mean, that, that's huge. I think one's lucky to be able to have such an interesting job. Um, but then hopefully, you know, I mean, a lot of people are unlucky. They don't have interesting jobs. You have a fascinating job. I love my job. I mean, you. you I mean, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you're incredibly good at it. Thank you. I mean, I have to think quite a lot when you ask <laughs> these questions. Yeah, because I don't want to ask. I don't want to ask silly questions that I know I'm not going to get the answers for. But I want to ask enough where people can get a just yeah, yeah. of what goes mm. on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't trip people up or ask yeah. stupid questions where there's going to be vital information yeah. given away with some Russian spy watching this or whatever, do you know what I mean? No, no, you, no, and you'll be no, on it. You'll be on it one million percent yeah. anyway. You would have read me at T and understood me anyway. No, you, you, yeah, you've made a very good agent runner. If that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe I am. <laughs> Maybe I fucking am. If someone wants to approach me and give me a few quid, listen, I'm all yours. Because police officers have said to me, you'd be a fucking great police officer. Yeah, you would. You'd you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's yeah. uh, that friendly environment yeah. just... Yeah. In fact, I might follow you after this interview <laughs> and see if you go into the six mil. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's just interesting how everybody's got different paths in life. Yes. And like you say, the people who just walk along the streets, people can only gather information from what you see online on the news, hmm. but it's not really real either because I mean, the news, everything can manipulate things and we do know they tell yes. lies now, but a lot of people, you've worked firsthand. You've seen hmm. terror attacks. Like you say, you've got hurt by it because part of the the people in there will probably blame themselves because they'll feel as if they've never done their job to 100% where they've saved lives, but they save lives every other day. Yeah, they, they do. You know what I'm saying? But they again, mm. how is it? So when you see a terror attack, like, and it does happen, when was the last one? Was it 7-7? Seven, seven? Mm. Well, the big one. Yeah. and oh, it's it Manchester. Manchester, oh yeah. And they try to do yeah. Glasgow, the cunts. Yeah. yeah. Fucking try to do Glasgow Airport. Yes, yes. And you see... The people affected, not only the people who have been killed and injured, but, you know, the families. Yeah. And, but as I said earlier, there, there's a pretty desperate feeling in the in the agencies at that time, you know. How is the feeling now? Because when I'm in London, there's always a feeling of unease here. I don't know if that's just me, but I always feel as if there's always bordering something brewing. And you come from Glasgow? I, I know, exactly. <laughs> that should be a walk in the park. That should be like sunshine and, and, and peace down here, but I just... It's just, I don't know, man. It's always an uneasy kind of environment sometimes. I used to love it down here, but I just feel as if there's something brewing. Um, I get the same feeling in Belfast as well. 
Belfast, uh, I, I, the one good thing is that, that um, you know, they, they've got together again at Stormont. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Really brilliant. And, uh, you know, one just hopes they don't get hung up on, on unification. Of course, that's out there, you know, to be discussed and all the rest of it. But really and truly, you know, if, if there's a lot of work that needs to be done in schools and hospitals and all the rest of it in, in mm -hmm. Northern Ireland. And they're good people. I love, people. Irish, oh, I love the Irish man. I love the I've got I. friends on both sides, mm. and I'm not. I'm, yes. That's not my field. I'm a Scotsman, no. but yeah. I just love because the it's mad how it just breaks your heart to see them fight against each other. Mm. But both wanted to fight, and that's ingrained in the Irish. Like they are tough bastards, man. They're lovely. They're fucking tough. Yeah, they are tough. They, for the grandparents to the kids, like they're just. There's some, like we talk about the DNA. Mm. There's definitely something in their DNA. They're just strong. If you're going to war, you mm. would want the Irish with mm. you. Because it's it's just, you, you do, yeah. That I, 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 I do have. A, gosh, I love the Irish. Yes, yeah. Yes. I don't understand the fucking word they say. They probably <laughs> say the same about me, but they're just something about them. They're mm. some. They're, they're wired different. Yeah, but they get on with life too. Yeah, you know. I, I, I think they've got a massive future, whether together or apart. You know, mm -hmm. it's that's up to them. Yeah, hopefully, and hopefully everything stays peaceful there. So, mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, so you seem you're in that job then. Like I know we we'll touch on human trafficking now. How big is human trafficking? People say now it's now took over the drug trade. I don't know in terms of that statistic, but mm -hmm. it is huge, of course. And there's so much money to be made out of it. And and you know, underneath the human trafficking, there's all the rest of it. You know prostitution and child trafficking and all the rest of it it's pretty horrific harvesting the, their organs mm. so how as a grand as a father yourself and grandfather how was it bad 70s 80s because it just seems to be more popular no. now no, no, no. of how luxurious how luxurious the this business and trade actually is because there's millions of people going missing every yes. year yeah. and yeah. Uh, like you say it's not just prostitution it's they're harvesting their, their organs, yes. their heart, their kidneys, yes. which is yes. big on the black market. So it's not just a case of selling a kilo of coke, no. which you'll never see again. With mm. kids or, and human trafficking, it's a revolving door with the money that you can yeah. make. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because you, you, one talks about countering uh, narcotics. And of course, you counter narcotics and off they go into human trafficking. You can't human trafficking and off they go into fraud. I mean, it's interesting what a couple of days ago they just set up the stop, um, look out for fraud um, initiative that's just come from, from the government and the police and um, the National Crime Agency. That now costs the UK people about eight billion a year. Just fraud online. So therefore we've had to move to counter that in a big way. Same with trafficking. The, the world, uh, because we no longer have barriers, and we have these things called um, boundaries or, or, or between states, but, you know, really forget it. Everything is on the internet now. Your major crimes on the internet. Boundaries are, are porous. People can get through them quite easily. Uh, and that is just great for crime, great for criminals. And certainly since Eastern Europe was let loose, you know, the, the breakup of the Soviet Empire, I think there's been a big increase in, in crime from that. What do you think of putting borders up where people can't come across the waters and just immigrating? And do you feel as if there should be more to protect? your own without because there's so much destruction you don't you can't just point, pinpoint certain people who do certain crimes because every color every nation everybody does crimes in every country but should there be more borders and more control of who's coming in and out no what we need is more cooperation i mean one of the problems in in five and six when when i was there was tracking um terrorists across borders and you'd find that uh the laws are all different I mean, for instance, you, you, you can't use telephone intercept here to prosecute a terrorist. You'd go over to Belgium, for instance, and you might not be able to use an agent without disclosing their identity. So all these laws are different, and you are trying to deal with international crime. 
And these organizations just take advantage of it. We would actually have to pinpoint a jurisdiction where the law worked better for us to prosecute a terrorist and actually try and sort of maneuver them there than um, having them prosecuted in the UK. So what should change then? Should it all International be, cooperation. So should there all be, do you think, one law, kind of one understanding of, if you, should you think they could use the British law if you went to another country and say, well, we can use this law as we're British? Like, for instance, the laws here are different from everywhere else, but yeah. if you know as an international criminal, do you think there should be a green light to say, let us charge them with the laws that we have in the UK? Or would that just be a free-for-all for then? I think everybody? it's a free-for-all, yes. yeah. I, th I think it so is harmonisation. It's a thin line though, isn't it? Yeah. To then, so why does not everybody work together then? Is it money or is it, what is it is involved? National pride. Is that what it is? Yeah. Because, yeah. listen, Britain's invaded over 90% yeah. of the world. Is, are we late anywhere? Have we got a rough understanding? Or do people always try and feel as if we've, or try to take from them. Well, I, I, it, 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 it's really curious. I remember uh, one of the things that, that we used to um, love doing was operating in France or Belgium or somewhere like that because overseeing this difficulty that I explained earlier about converting intelligence into evidence to use in court, mm -hmm. in France, but say particularly France, we used to go to um, a guy called the examining judge. And we could go to him and he would, we would give, us, give him all the evidence that we had, all the intelligence we had, and he would sift through it as we were going through the operation. And he would tell us at that particular point, yes, you can use this evidence to go to trial. No, you needn't use that evidence because it's not going to help the defense. So instead of us guessing, or trying to anticipate what the court would do, this guy would actually tell us as we went along exactly how the trial would progress. Does that make sense? Yeah. I thought everybody would be working together, though. Uh, when I suggested this to uh, an MP who I won't name, mm. he said, do you know, he said, if you suggested that we used the French system in the United Kingdom, you'd hear the laughter from Parliament in Paris. That's the sort of attitude one has to fight against. That's fucking strange. I thought everybody would be controlled by the same organisation. I thought it would be one person calling the shots from no. everywhere. I no. thought the borders and all that bullshit and mm. was just all an exaggeration of, no. oh, yeah, there's politics and people mm. with this. But that actually happens. There is... Okay. And that's why, you know, I said earlier... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's why I said earlier, you know, no, it's not a question of borders. It's a question of smashing them down. So, that's, so there's a lot mm. of things that there's so much red tape for people to then mm. make moves on certain things mm. because of pride of no you're not getting in or mm. your, thought, your legal system isn't as good as our legal system you know it, it it's all that see that's why i thought they all had the secret meetings to say okay this and that so i thought everything would have been not a free-for-all but an understanding okay just go and get them mm. so they can actually stop you from going in and working there as well well you, you i mean it, at the agency level and the yeah. police level, there's cooperation. It, it, it's at the legal level that one gets the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the law level, yeah, yeah, the yeah. legislation level. See, I thought it would have been some European courts or some system to say, listen, let them in. There would have been people higher up just to let someone get on good? with it. Yeah, wouldn't that be good? I thought, I genuinely, I, again, that just shows you the lack of intelligence and the lack of knowledge that one can have to then understand what actually goes on in the system. Mm. I think that was probably the hardest part of my job, actually. Is that the, the most frustrating part of the job? Well, not distressing, but I think it, 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 it was hard trying to get people to understand, you know, in, in, in the ministries, if you like, or the departments of state, that uh, hanging on to the British common law in the face of a world which actually depends largely on... on um, the civil codes that they that they have uh, isn't necessarily in our best interest. Is Britain still a force? Oh, yes. Yeah, still a strong force? Mm. Yeah. Because obviously with the lack of funding, and <clears throat> I don't know if we've got many in the militaries we used to have as well, but I just know, why, why, why are we a strong force then? 
Is that because the intelligence and obviously the SAS are a strong force in their own right as well? But obviously, lack of numbers when you look at China and Russia and other countries. But why are we a strong force? Well, special forces are hugely respected wherever you go. Yeah, in the world. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they are top dog. The best, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, are yeah, yeah. Absolutely top and dog. And I've spoke to guys in the Navy SEALs and that, and they'll say, mm. listen, I was always going to be everybody thinks they're better than other, but they're, mm. the SAS are massively no, respected. They are, they're, 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 they're brilliant. Uh, the intelligence agencies are recognized as, you know, the best. I, I, I'd i like to say that, yeah. You're going to say that I anyway, mean, but yeah, yeah, yeah you're I'd going to be biased anyway. because you worked there. Yeah. No, I can't. I've got to be balanced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but on a balanced view, yes. I mean, they're, they're immensely impressive. Um, I think also it, it, it's that you, you, you spoke earlier about, you know, are we proud to be British? Um, and we were sort of talking about, well, actually, we, we, we like to sort of go on with people on the whole. Um, if anybody comes and pokes our eye, we'll react. Um, but on the whole, we like to get on with people, and I think I think the world generally looks on us as being the balancers. Certainly in the EU, when we were there, um, don't talk to me about getting out. That's so outrageous. Um, we were the balancers between the various states, and people look to us to do that, and they still do in the international community. I mean, I was in the Foreign Office going out on multilateral conference area, lots of states, um, the Brits were usually looked to to sort of create some sort of balance. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people would think the opposite though, because we have been so ruthless in the past and kind of, like I say, invading over 90% of the world, but it's a strong, it's a strong fucking nation. Hmm. It's very strong and it's, it's mad to think because of the, popula the population here, it's not that big. No, 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 no. I mean, we do punch well above our weight. There's no doubt about yeah. that in the international community. So what, again, with Brexit, look what, so you were against that? Oh, yes. I was mad to come out of the EU. Why did they? I think the people were misled. They thought you know, we could all go back to being this sort of yeehaw nation state. It just doesn't work in the international community anymore. Do you think that's damaging towards the people in the UK? With travel and money and... Yes, of course. Because I know all this stuff now is getting... It's more for people's businesses aren't the same as well because no. of stocks not getting delivered on time and mm. everything's kind of upside down. Yes. I mean, if you were in Europe, would you really look to trade with us if, with all the difficulties if you could trade somewhere else easier? What makes the world better? Cooperation, balance, m meeting up, talking, hearts and minds trying to see the other person's point of view, trying to match it to your own. Who do you think should be leading the UK? I don't go politics. Do you not? No. Why? A, because you couldn't really do it if you were working in the Foreign Office. You had to keep a completely open mind. Balanced. Yeah, you're, you're advising whichever government is there at the day and you had to keep balanced i keep going back to that i'm sorry that's the last thing that's your your life the theme. but is that yeah. to stay up is that just to support anything that's happening in the uk just to stay no to just give, not get involved to give to give balance to, no it's really to give balance advice i think the other thing is uh as a lawyer one likes to work from facts yeah where can you actually get the facts unless you're operating in, in, in the system itself. Um, newspapers all have a, a slant and you have to sort of try and work out mm -hmm. what's what. And I prefer to stay out of, to stay out of politics and, and um, keep my thoughts to myself. Would you have done any job for MI5, MI6? Well, I mean, you certainly wouldn't do a job that was contrary, you know, that was illegal. Yeah, the, of course, but yeah. can do you, do you, is a job for you just to do, or can you reject it if you didn't like it? Yeah, you could do. You didn't, though? No, I mean, I, I think the beauty of working with them is the fact you're working with people who are um, who are bright enough, clever enough, and, and understand um, that if you're going to do something illegal, all you're doing is wrecking it. You're, you're, you're just wrecking your investigation. I mean, A, because you'll never get it to court. 
B, because you'll be found out, and that undermines the whole of the whole of the agency. Um, I mean, at the time when I joined, uh, we had Bettany, who was a spy who, who went to the Russians, and we had this idiot Peter Wright who had written a stupid book that the government tried to stop. This undermined the agency. Yeah, um, what happened? Peter Wright, what was it? He wrote a book that came he, down. He had a bee in his bonnet about um, some, I think it was Hollis, who, who he thought was a, a Russian spy. And he wanted to write a book and he was told he couldn't. So he went to Australia and wrote it from there. And of course, the British government tried to stop it. But when you look at the Peter Wright book, it was nothing more than gossip, really. You know, he was a strange person. So uh, again... I'm surprised again the British never had pull to stop anything. I thought, you know how when people get cancelled or when they can do this and do that, I thought there was so much power out there that anything could be got. So it surprises me that it was allowed allowed to release the book in Australia where they've just let it happen without no oh, pulling yeah. the plug on it. That's crazy for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I they just went, thought everybody was working together. Like when you talk about France and everybody laughing because they think mm. fuck the British, mm. like it's just puzzling. When again, that's how these podcasts are important for give people an understanding that not everybody's in agreement no. with each other. No, well, it's freedom of speech. He, he was, I mean, provided he wasn't actually damaging national security, and there was nothing in that book where you could say it damaged national security. Again, it was it was on the cusp of. Um, Everything was dreadfully secret during the Cold War. Nothing was ever talked about. I mean, nobody talked about MI5 or MI6 in those days. Mm -hmm. you know, and if you did, you, you, know, you, you got into trouble. Um, so the sea change was absolutely massive. From, from um, We couldn't even prosecute terrorists in open court. We couldn't prosecute terrorists back then before I joined the agency. Why? Because we couldn't convert intelligence into evidence. They didn't have the, the structure to do it. They weren't legislated for. How can you go? You could go to a secret court to prosecute spies with evidence, um, but you couldn't go into an open court. And if you're dealing with terrorists, it's a totally different animal to dealing with um, spies. You must have an open court if you're dealing with terrorism. You, because otherwise you're feeding the terrorists everything secret. Therefore, the terrorists say if it's all secret, then obviously they're lying. But if you go to open court and prosecute a terrorist and the evidence is there for everybody to see, you're, you're much more plausible as an agency. So we had to change all that. What's it like, work, like working with terrorists? What's it like? How's that feeling? That That's down to the officers. I mean... Uh, you, you just feel, here's someone who's doing something wrong. Now we must try and bring that person to trial, try and convict them. And therefore, from my perspective, that was the objective. One didn't feel anything other than this terrorist has rights, therefore I have to respect them. Do you respect them? Hmm. Uh, yeah, terrorists. Uh, yeah, no, no, because I watched an interview and you said something about terrorists should have rights or something. Yes. What was it he says? Yes, found it that is interesting. Terrorists, terrorists do have rights. Yeah, what sort of rights? They have a right to life, uh, unless um, it, it can be taken away in terms of self defense, rather like Israel and, and Hamas at the moment. They have a right to a family life, you can't go and um, do things to their family. Uh, to, to get at them, um, they have a right to free speech. So, providing they're not proselytizing terrorism, they, they can say what they like. Yeah, because there are limitations. Everybody should have free speech, but there's a thin line between free speech and hate speech. Of course, you know? absolutely. They, they, you, they can't do that, not at all. They have a right not to be tortured. Uh, and that's where the United States went so wrong with waterboarding doesn't do anybody any good anyway operationally but um you know no terrorists should be waterboarded what was that uh when they put into water and half drowned in order to make them talk 
Yeah, I always thought the torture tactics was what it was all about. Like if as a terrorist, I'm thinking, fuck him, man, torture him. <laughs> but it's, uh, that's what I thought it was all about. I don't know if that's because of the movies that we watch all through the years. Oh, of course. And we, in our minds, we believe that it's all what's real. Yeah. But you actually break it all down. We're so far from the truth. See? Nobody really knows what goes on. Obviously, you'll say enough, but mm. you'll have that much information that you'll die with. Hmm. which is a good thing again because people would be shit scared if they actually knew what was going on in, in the real world hmm. do you think fear is a big part of control on this planet mm -hmm. people can be controlled easily with fear yes uh, that's certainly i agree with that yes yes yes, yes. Uh, blackmail bribery extortion mm -hmm. um yeah and, and just fear for, for one's own safety yes mm -hmm. how long did you work with the intelligence for uh about nine years do you miss it? No. Why? Well, I I, I left um, because I thought I'd done enough. It was a time of massive change. And I'd got to the point where the change that I'd done, I suppose, again, that sounds slightly pompous, but I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. There were one or two other things that I wanted to achieve, but I saw that I couldn't because I wasn't going to persuade people from within. So I came out mm. and persuaded them from outside with the knowledge that you have and the life that you've led what do you think life is david i think i think one, one's just got to get on with it i i mean some people do have major problems obviously um with, with, with the awful things that happen to them but i think my wife has a brilliant expression for it um she was at boarding school as well from seven years so you know we match <laughs> you've got an understanding of we each have other a total understanding yeah. <laughs> yeah it's that sort of boarding school syndrome where yeah. you've got to get on or, uh -huh. or die yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like fucking life man like yeah, you yeah. say you've just got to keep showing up you've you just you got do. to keep going yes and in this environment and i don't want to bring people down because i've battled no. mental health and i've had mm. drink and drugs in the past where i've escaped mm. but there comes a stage where i don't fuck this man I need to make changes. You said you had escaped. Mm -hmm. My view of that is, no, you didn't escape. You got yourself together, which takes a huge amount of courage. I find that impressive. I really do. It's the sort of courage you see in the sort of agencies, you know. Yeah, don't, don't say you escaped. You mm -hmm. didn't. You did it yourself, and that's hugely impressive. Yeah, I appreciate that. No. True. So how how important is it, David, to have a good woman by your side? Huge. Absolutely huge. Because they keep you out of the ivory tower. What I call the ivory tower, you know. Oh, I'm right. <laughs> That's me, mate. <laughs> I should change my name to fucking ivory tower. That's me. I think I've got ego. I've got fucking issues where I struggle, I think, to commit, if I'm honest. I think back in the days where I think you were married at 17, 18, and you were free flowing, you worked at it. Mm. When there was a struggle, when the shit hit the fan, mm. you spoke mm. it out. Mm. You've maybe had a little argument from time to time, mm. but you spoke it out and you didn't leave. Mm. Everybody's walking away from each other mm. now, David. Everybody's mm. soft where there's no communication that we spoke about earlier, and that saddens me. I don't, yes. again, social media comes into play because there's so many options. Yes. Um, we've got screens just full of women in bikinis, and they yeah, 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 everybody's yeah, yeah, in yeah, contact yeah. with yeah. each other. So, Again, for your own perspective, is it for a good woman in life? Do you feel that gives you, like you say, balance? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and she's balanced. I mean, her her philosophy that was taught to her by her her headmistress at school was, life is tough. Why should you think it might not be? And if things are hard, go and scrub a floor. Don't start wallowing in self pity. Mm -hmm. Which so I think is a. I, I think there's two really do help get one through life do you think we can feel sorry for ourselves too much yeah it feels as if the world's against us mm -hmm. but you've actually been to these third world countries you've seen what mm -hmm. real struggle is yes. do you think we've got it too easy no i, th I think uh, there are a lot of people here who really do have a, a hard life there's no doubt about that at all um the difficulty is trying to see how one can help them more you know, and it's not just a question of chucking cash at it. It's a question of more than that. It's a question of f going out and, and meeting them and, and, and trying to help them their problems. Not that I'm saying that I do that, mm -hmm. 
But I think that there are people who can do that or are really good at it. I mean, you yourself reach out to people and, and get them to talk and you get some sort of understanding of what's going on. I find that very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, but I just, it's an understanding, because I'm, everybody's different. Yes. It's an understanding of everybody's life, whether it's the criminal, whether it's the, mm. the agent, whether it's the SCS guy, the homeless guy, mm. the billionaire. Everybody's different because they've got different levels of trauma, but I've can, I've spoke to people with 100% worse trauma than me who are happier than me as well. Mm. So everything's to do with how you perceive the world and how you want to make the changes to then be better at it. Nothing changes unless you do. No, and I'm glad you said that because I, I do agree with that entirely. I, I think it is down to the individual. And, but going back to it, some individuals have it a hell of a lot harder yeah. than others. But they've created a better future than the ones who have not had a hard. Sure. I, I think that's right. And as I say, it all goes back to scrub a floor. Mm -hmm. You know. Just get on with it. Get on with it. Do something. Yes. That's the, for me as well. For anybody watching or listening, mm -hmm. just show up, just push mm -hmm. forward, whether mm -hmm. it's walking or cutting the garden or painting the house just yeah. do something to take yeah. your mind off of what you're struggling mm. with but again a lot of people are dipping themselves into fucking drugs and drinking crazy shit they're online and they're just becoming more lost to their true potential and everybody's got massive potential and that's the scary thing everybody's got greatness and everybody's got something special in them that they can dig deep and make changes and doesn't matter what age you are it's people in their 70s 80s 90s who are learning new instruments learning new languages mm fucking doing new things where mm. it's never over until it's over no no and, and you're absolutely right everybody has an ability to do something and achieve something yeah whatever it is it doesn't matter how many books have you wrote david three and what are the what's the three oh, books? the latest one's coming out in in april yeah and mm. that's uh catcher's first operation is that the follow-up to your first yes yeah, the follow-up to the first and you're going to do four of them is that correct yes that's right. Where can people buy your books? At Waterstones and uh, Amazon mm -hmm. and uh, Hatchards in London and I think various other bookshops. Yeah. Where do you go forward for the future, David? Well, we're right the next. Well, we're in the, starting the next book, mm -hmm. um, which is The Stringer, which is set in uh, Siberia, which we thought we'd go to a cold country since the last two books were in hot ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can go to Scotland then. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, go to Scotland. <laughs> is, uh, is that what you're finding, your sort of peace and your new kind of drive in life, is it being an author? Yes, I, I, we, we, uh, as I say, we, because, um, you know, I found that, you know, my granddaughter invited me down to talk about spies. You know, I hadn't sort of thought about much about it. And it was, it was at that point, you know, she's, she's a feisty kid and just reminded me so much. <laughs> of the uh, uh, women in, in the agencies, you know. They, they are so good. That sort of very talented on the one hand, but as I said, you do not want to meet them on a hockey pitch <laughs> yeah. on the other hand. So, yes, uh, and we spent some time, Carrie and I write together, mm -hmm. my wife and I, and uh, we'd spent some time um, after the first book, which we published oh, about, 15 years ago, we got caught into writing short films, infomercials for co mm -hmm. corporations, you know, comedies or dramas. And, uh, you know, I sort of thought, well, yes, that's all great fun, but why not write a book? And that, that the catalyst was going down talking to these kids at school, and they were all fascinated. Yeah. And you sort of thought, oh, yeah, Katya would be a great, and she's Russian. And, you know, Russians are nice people. I like Russians. Yeah, I've, yeah like I say, I've come across every <laughs> culture and every, basically nearly every country now and I've travelled all over the world and it's, I, I get on with people. No matter, I could sit anywhere. I could genuinely sit anywhere and have a conversation and have a laugh. And I'm surprised because my accent's so strong. I think people might just be laughing at the accent and thinking, what the fuck is this guy saying? Oh, it's but whatever it is, it's working and, you have got a fascinating story and an interesting story with the people you've worked with, the intelligence that you have of where the world operates and people are intrigued by it because there's not many people speak out against MI5 and MI6 and to get the clearance of it, it shows you how well respected you are in that field to not say anything stupid or betray yourself because everything will be calculated with you. You'll be a very good chess player where you're already steps ahead of everybody else because in that job, 
they only want the best from you and they want the best of the best. So you've lived that, you've learned from it, you've experienced yourself from it and you're a top guy from it as well. Which is why I say you'd be a very good agent, Ronna, because you use flattery perfectly. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. But again, that's why you're the best, because you see through my bullshit, do you know what I mean? If I was to interview an MI5 or MI6 every time, I'd be a fucking job. <laughs> it's, uh, for anybody that's watching, David, that's in a life of struggle right now, what advice would you have for them? I'd have those, just, just keep going. Look for the best that you can possibly see and go for it. And if it make, if you have to make a change, make it. Just, just make it. Mm -hmm. Don't think too much about life. David, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just to say thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think I've said far too much. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been yeah. a pleasure. Thanks very much, And uh, thanks for your time and coming on. I wish you nothing but the best for the future and Thanks good luck with the books, David. Thanks very much indeed. You.